So today we're in chapter 8, but before we dig into chapter 8 of Proverbs, uh, sometimes you have to, I mean, we've been, we've been laser focused on the Word of God. We've been taking it word by word, verse by verse, and just tearing it up and breaking it down and getting to the nitty gritty of what each individual verse means by analyzing each word. But before we get into um, chapter 8, I want to kind of pull back and, and get a bird's eye view of chapters 8 and 9, because I think chapters 8 and 9 go together. And these are unique chapters in the book of Proverbs because I don't know if Solomon intended to do this. I don't know if the Lord directed him to do this, but you actually have a three-act play in Proverbs chapter 8 and 9. If I was to title this play, I would call it Wisdom Calls. So it's a three-act play made up of Proverbs chapter 8 and 9. And so you have three main characters in this three-act play. You have the narrator. Every good story needs a narrator. You have the character of wisdom. And we've seen wisdom in different roles within Proverbs. She's been a lover. She's been a sister. And here it's almost as if she's some sort of authoritative ruler, some sort of uh, like a matriarch. Or I, I kind of, uh, when, when I read this, I kind of get the picture of Lady Liberty. You know, some, someone that's very majestic and authoritative. And then the final main character is you have folly, which is wisdom's opposite. Yeah, yeah. Now, you also have a supporting cast. And the supporting cast is understanding and prudence. And they are sort of like wisdom's handmaids or wisdom's younger sisters, if you will. Now, the first act uh, comprises chapter 8. And the narrator's part is verses 1 through 3 of chapter 8. Wisdom pretty much takes center stage and the spotlight in this play of uh, chapter 8. She has the rest of the verses, verses 4 through 36. And then you have chapter 9, which is broken up into two more acts. So act 2 uh, is the narrator, and he kind of gives the introduction in the first three verses. Wisdom, again, takes the spotlight in verses 4 through 6, and then the narrator takes over the rest of the story uh, that, uh, of the second act from verses 7 through 12. The narrator takes a, a short pause because they're entering act 3 when you come to verse 13 of chapter 9. So the narrator speaks uh, chapter 9, verses 13 and 15, and he's introducing a new character. And that is folly. And folly takes the next two verses, which is 16 and 17. And the narrator closes Act 3 and thus closing the play with verse 18. And so it's wisdom calls. So I think it would be appropriate before we really dig into some things if maybe we just read <coughs> chapters 8 and 9. <laughs> and I'm going to try to do my best uh, with voices and characterizations. So let me see if I can get my James Earl Jones going on here, because I'll, I'll let him be the voice of the narrator, and I'll just use my regular voice as wisdom, and I'll have another voice for folly. So, Wisdom Calls, Act 1, a play by King Solomon, Proverbs chapter 8. Does not wisdom call, and understanding lift up her voice, on the top of the heights, Beside the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates, at the opening to the city, at the entrance of the doors, she cries out. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O naive ones, discern prudence, and O fools, discern wisdom. Listen, for I will speak noble things. And the opening of my lips will produce right things. For my mouth will utter truth. And wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the utterance of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. They are all straightforward to him who understands. And right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction and not silver. And knowledge... Rather than choicest gold, 
For wisdom is better than jewels, and all desirable things cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I have knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. Counsel is mine, and sound wisdom. I, and under, I am understanding. Power is mine. By me kings reign, and rulers decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles all who judge rightly. I love those who love me, and those who diligently seek me will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold, and my yield than choicest of silver. I walk in the way of righteousness and in the midst of the paths of justice to endow those who love me with wealth, that I may fill their treasuries. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before the works of old, from everlasting I was established, from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not made the earth and the fields, nor the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set forth seas, its boundaries, so that the water should not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Now therefore, O sons, listen to me, for beside, for blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me and watches daily at my gates, waiting at my doorpost. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me injures himself. All those who hate me love death. And scene, the end of Act 1. Proverbs chapter 9 begins Act 2 with the narrator. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out seven pillars. She has prepared her food and has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has set out maidens. She calls from the top of the heights of the city. Whoever is naive, let him come in here. To him who lacks understanding, she says, come and eat my food and drink my wine I have mixed. Forsake your folly and live and proceed in the ways of understanding. He who corrects a scoffer gets dishonor for himself and he reproves a wicked man gets insults for himself. Do not reprove a scoffer, lest he hate you. And reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of life be added to you. If you are wise, if you are wise, you are wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you alone will bear it. So that brings the end of Act Two. So Act Three, the narrator starts again in verse 13. The woman folly is boisterous. She is naive and knows nothing. And she sits at her doorway of her house, on a seat by the high places of the city, calling to those who pass by, who are willing to make their paths straight. 
Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks understanding, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. The end of Act 3, and therefore the end of the play, Wisdom Calls. Now I remember when I first discovered Proverbs 8 and 9, and kind of put them together as a play, I, I was like, I would love to perform this, to get a few characters uh, to actually memorize these lines and perform them. I think it would be a great play. And there's a lot of places in scripture that um, is almost like a play. I remember one time uh, in Bible college, I had this idea. You remember in the Old Testament where uh, half the tribes were split up. Half of them was on Mount Ebal and the other half was on Mount Gerizim. One uh, mountain represented blessings and the other mountain represented curses. And right in the valley was the Levites. And so the Levites... Uh, you know, were, were kind of the, uh, the response. So you had, um, you had uh, uh, the ones on the mountain pr pronouncing the blessings of God and the other ones pronouncing the curses of God. And I thought, you know, it'd be great to have like maybe the blessings on a balcony and maybe have on, a, on the stage, um, you know, the, the uh, other mountain uh, pronouncing the curses and in the audience have the Levites. I thought it would be a great play, and it's still something that maybe I'd like to do one day. But I remember in Bible college being in the chapel and looking at the way the chapel was set up and like, yeah, this play could really work. And, you know, it's a great way to memorize the Word of God and to have the Word of God uh, have a true impact on your life is when you look at it in a different perspective like that. Um, one way that the Jewish people have been able to memorize all five books of Moses, at the very least, is through song. Now, uh, the Hebrew language is a consonant, uh, it's a consonant language, meaning there's no vowels. So you have to be really a native speaker of Hebrew to understand um, the different Hebrew words, because you can have one word, and it's spelt one way, but by the different vowel marks and the different pronunciations, it can mean a different thing. So you have the word uh, melech which means king, but yet you pronounce it malak, and it means messenger or angel. So how do you know unless you're a native speaker and unless you know the context of scripture? So as time progressed, what they did to kind of assist the non-Hebrew reader is they created these vowel marks, and they put these vowel marks in the text so you know exactly, you know if it's malak or malak, and you know how to translate it, and you know also how to pronounce it. So. Um, You've probably heard Gregorian chant, right? Has anybody heard Gregorian chant where they're uh, singing songs or praying in Latin and it's very melodic and it's a cappella? Well, kind of in the same way, uh, this is what's done in Judaism. You, in synagogues, every Sabbath, you have the big scroll of the Torah. All five books are in, in this scroll. And so every week they, they make a, a parade, a procession with the Torah scroll. And the Torah scroll is heavy and it's huge. And I've, I've been in this procession before. Um, it's actually clothed like a king because, you know, this is God's law. This is God's word. So these are God's commands. And so since God is not visible and, you know, God is not visibly present, we dress up the Torah scroll as the king because it represents God's word. So actually the Torah scroll is covered with like what looks like a velvet robe. And it's got these beautiful fringes on the bottom of it. And then there's actually a breastplate, like the breastplate that the priests would wear in the, in the tabernacle and temple that's placed over the Torah scroll. And along with it is what's called a yod. And the word yod means finger or means hand. And this yod is actually a pointer, so when they unroll the scroll, they could use that pointer to keep their place instead of putting their dirty, greasy hand on the scroll itself, you know, and that would promote deterioration and corruption of the text. Mm -hmm. So, uh, not, and, and the Torah scroll is then crowned with an actual crown. And so there's some scriptures that are quoted, and the Torah scroll is, is marched around the synagogue. And as the Torah scroll is marched around the synagogue, out of respect and reverence and uh, an act of uh, obedience and submission to God's word, they take the fringes that are either on their prayer shawl 
uh, or on their clothing, and they'll kiss they'll kiss the fringe and then lay it on the velvet robe of the Torah scroll. So kind of pledging their allegiance to God's word. So it's a very beautiful uh, procession. So when the uh, so so when the scroll is taken up to what's called the bima, they have a pulpit and then they have a bima. The pulpit is just like our pulpit that we preach from, but the bima is a table, and they roll the scroll out on the table, and then each week there's a particular portion for each week, uh, for each Sabbath that's read until all 52 weeks of the year they get to they get to read all five books of Moses in those 52 weeks. And so no matter which synagogue you go to around the world, you don't have to wonder what they're going to be preaching about or what they're going to be speaking on or where they're going to be reading from. They already know because every synagogue follows this uh, Torah reading cycle. So when the scroll is open, there's a special man. His name, uh, he's called the Cantor. And he has memorized uh, the entire five books of Moses and knows how to sing them, knows how to chant them. Because there's a certain cadence and a certain rhythm, and uh, and and the way that the 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 words of the Torah are actually copied, sometimes it gives an indication of what the cantor is supposed to do. So there's certain parts of the Torah where it's talking about, let's just for instance, uh, where it's saying that uh, Israel went down into the valley or went somewhere. It would actually be written in such a way where these words look like they're descending almost like stairs. And so it would give an indication to the cantor on how to chant that or how to sing that. So it's very beautiful. And so that's one way to be able to put the word of God to memory is to be able to sing it. Because we remember a song more than we remember, you know, just like regular words. So uh, in school, one of the first things that we had to memorize was the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln. So a lot of kids would turn it into a song or they would turn it into a rap and that way they would be able to memorize that and pass the class. Uh, so it, it's kind of this similar with the word of God. So it's, it's very beautiful when you're sitting in the synagogue and be able to hear the word of God in the original Hebrew and it melodically being chanted or melodically being sung. Do they have that synagogue in Canada? Oh yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's one in Fredericton. Yeah, yeah, there's a synagogue in Fredericton. So uh, let's go ahead and dig into um, Proverbs chapter 8, and we'll begin with verse 1. What's the memory verse? Oh, yeah, the memory verse for chapter 8, good question, is 8.13. It says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. So that's the memory verse for this chapter, which is fairly easy, pretty easy to remember. So uh, Act 1, uh, the narrator, verses 1 through 3 of chapter 8, says, Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? So let's just break that very uh, first verse down. It says, Does not wisdom call? Now this word call... What do you think of when you when you read the word call? Besides our Western minds, we think of a telephone or a cell phone. But if somebody says, I'm going to call out to you, what does that make you think? It says cry in my Bible. Cry, okay. That's, one, that's another translation. Does, it ha does anybody have anything different besides call or cry? Well, the Hebrew word actually means to roar. It means to roar. It also means to proclaim or to summon. So what I'm picturing is wisdom because it says um, that she's standing beside – it says uh, on top of the heights, verse 2, on top of the heights, beside the way. In other words, where there's a lot of traffic going by, where the paths meet at an intersection, <laughs> she takes her stand. So I imagine her on this elevated platform of some sort. Maybe it's a city wall or maybe it's a little, you know, or, or sometimes, uh, you know, if it's at an intersection. Remember before that they were uh, traffic lights, you had a traffic cop that would direct the traffic. And he was on like a little elevated platform. That's kind of what I imagine. But it says, does not wisdom call? 
So they didn't have microphones and PA systems back then. They didn't have megaphones back then. So I just imagine that Wisdom is on her platform and she's cupping her hands over her mouth and she's calling loudly. Because when you cup your hands together, it creates like a little megaphone and you can hear a lot better. And that's, that's kind of what this uh, Hebrew word is kind of giving you the picture of and it's kind of uh, intonating here. Does not wisdom call? Does not wisdom roar? Does not wisdom cry out? In other words, wisdom is proclaiming and she's summoning as she's proclaiming because she's trying to get everybody's attention to kind of gather around her so she can deliver her message. So I, I love that picture there. Does not wisdom roar? And wisdom, you know, you think of wisdom and you think of like maybe the good little angel that sits on your shoulder that's, you know, represented in these cartoons. Or you think of the conscious uh, of Jiminy Cricket, you know, how he's your good conscience or whatever. And you just think of something very small and very weak, you know, or you think of a goody two-shoe. And in these cartoons, it's like the devil is mean, but he seems to always be tougher than that little angel. But that's not what the way wisdom is. Wisdom is the superior one. Wisdom is the strong one. Just because somebody is, is uh, good doesn't mean that they're weak. So it says, does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? So understanding is sort of like her assistant. So you have, uh, you have understanding lifting up. That word lift actually means to give, to give a present. So wisdom is roaring here, and understanding is, is uh, lifting up her voice. So lifting up her voice as a present, as a gift. And it kind of reminds me as, of Moses and Aaron in a way, because at first Moses, when God said, I want you to go to Egypt, and I want you to speak to the Pharaoh, Moses is like, you've got the wrong guy. I'm not the one. I'm not a good speaker. I, you know, and we know that Moses had a speech impediment. Now, this is a little bunny trail here, but do you know why Moses had a speech impediment? According to the book of Jasher, which is an extra biblical book, uh, the story goes is that one day Pharaoh had baby Moses on his lap. And you know how babies instinctually reach for things. So baby Moses reached for Pharaoh's crown. And all of a sudden, his magicians and sorcerers and wise men said, oh, this is a bad omen. This is a bad sign. This means that this little child is going to take, take you over. It's going to knock you off the throne. And the Pharaoh's like, yeah, right. Well, well let's, let's put it to the test. So what they did is they put a piece of gold, uh, you know, and how shiny gold is, and it's very vibrant. They put a piece of gold in front of Moses beside a red-hot coal. And they said, okay, we're going to test. If Moses reaches for the piece of gold, we'll know that he is out for my throne, and we'll just get rid of him right here and now. And so it says that as Moses was reached, baby Moses was reaching for the gold, an angel of the Lord pushed his hand over to the coal. And he grabbed that hot piece of coal. And what do babies do when they grab something? They automatically put it in their mouth. So Moses touched the hot coal to his lips and burnt and disfigured his lips, and that's why he had a speech impediment, according to the book of Jasher. Now, it's not canon. It's not inspired. No, but because he was raised by his own mother for the first four years of his life. Right. He was raised by his mother for the first four years, four years, of, years of his life, and he never, he, she never, uh, he never went into Pharaoh until he was weaned. So the first four years, he would have been with his own mother. So. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if Jasher saying this took place after that or whatever. I think it's an interesting story that kind of gives an explanation of why Moses had this speech impediment. Like I said, don't know if it's true or not, but I just think it's a, a really neat story. So just as, you know, Moses said, you've got the wrong guy. You know, my tongue is thick or my tongue is slow and I can't, I'm not a good speaker. He's like, fine, fine, fine. I'll let Aaron, your big brother, be your spokesman, right? So he was good with that. And true, Aaron did speak at the first, but shortly after that, somewhere, Moses got his confidence, and you really don't see Aaron speaking too much after that first little bit. So it kind of reminds me of wisdom and understanding. Understanding aids wisdom and lifts up her voice and backs up what wisdom says, kind of like how Aaron backed up Moses and kind of assisted and helped Moses. 
So it says an understanding lifts up or gives her voice as a gift. Now this word voice actually could also be translated thunder. It's been translated in different parts of scripture depending on the context as a voice or as thunder. And when we encounter that uh, section in the Torah where Moses is at Mount Sinai and it says there were thunderings and lightnings on the mountain, the Jewish translation of the scriptures actually says voices instead of thunders, as it says in most Protestant English Bibles. So it, I think that, you know, it gives wisdom a mighty, a mighty roar. So wisdom is kind of roaring like a lion. And when a lion roars, it kind of instills fear in you. It, it, it makes you take, it makes you stand up. It makes you take notice. It puts you on alert. Now, understanding is, you know, assisting wisdom and giving uh, her voice as a gift to wisdom to kind of lift up. But understanding is not meek and milly mouthed either because it says understanding lifts up, which implies that it's raising, like raising the voice, lifts up her voice. And that word voice could also mean thunder. There's several other words that mean voice if you just simply wanted to say voice. But it's – but – God inspired Solomon to specifically choose this particular word voice, which means thunder, which also implies that understanding is speaking loudly, that understanding is speaking authoritatively. And sometimes when there's a clap of thunder and you're not expecting it, you kind of shake and you take you, you, you stay, you get on alert and you get attention. You know, you, you give attention. So wisdom and understanding, though they're good, though they're righteous, though they're holy, Though they're kind of represented and painted as beautiful women in this play, they're not to be messed with. You know, I remember watching Wonder Woman when I was a little kid, and a lot of these bad guys, you know, you know, Linda Carter played Wonder Woman in the in the uh, series that I remember. And they tried to take advantage of Wonder Woman and say, oh, it's a girl, I could beat up a girl. You know, but they didn't understand that Wonder Woman was Wonder Woman, you know, and she whooped the pants off these men. So it's kind of like wisdom and understanding. Don't underestimate wisdom and understanding. Though under, wisdom and understanding are good doesn't mean they're weak. Though wisdom and understanding are beautiful and holy doesn't mean that you can take advantage of them and walk all over them. They can thunder. They can roar. They have a reputation of a lion and reputation of a thunderstorm. So does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? Verse 2, on the top of the heights and beside the way. So the word top in Hebrew also means head. So in other words, it's a place that's prominent. It's a place that's immediately somebody's going to notice. So it's kind of like uh, if you're going, if you're driving into a city or driving into a place, one of the things that you notice is a sign that's telling you where you're at. It's put in a very prominent place, you know, like welcome to Perth Andover. You're on the Trans Canada and you know you're almost home when you see that big sign, welcome to Perth Andover. Now, sometimes these signs can lie, and I'll tell you why. I hate going to Fredericton and seeing that sign, Welcome to Fredericton, and you're still 20 minutes away from the city. I'm thinking, you liar. And Pam's like, well, that's where the town limits are. I'm like, it's nothing but wilderness until 20 minutes later, so I hate seeing that sign. It's like, don't tell me I'm in Fredericton. I know I'm not in Fredericton. But it's a sign you can't miss, right? It's prominent. It's got the it's 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 got the uh, Mountie pictured there, right? You know, saying, "Hey, welcome to Fredericton." You gotta go in a certain way, and there's all kinds of traffic that might hit you too. Yeah. You have to go down further instead of going in the first one. And it I used to be good to go in the first one, but they changed it. Yeah. And I remember uh, when I was in Nigeria, uh, one of the most impressive uh, states in Nigeria was Emu State. And it seems like everybody from Emu State has immigrated all over the world because if I run into an Ibu person, uh, I say, where are you from? They're either from Anambra State or Emu State. Anambra is where the king lives. Emu State is a very big and populous state as well. But when you go into Emu State, you, you, it's like there's this big gate or this big structure that it's, all, it's, like, uh, it's, it's hard to describe, but you're driving right under it and you can't miss it. So this is kind of like what, what is being pictured here, on the, at the head or at the top of the heights, by the way. Um, heights means high places. So uh, also when you're reading the scriptures, 
and it talks about a lot of times they sacrificed on the high places. So this head or this, this place in the heights is connotating, number one, a place that you can't miss. Number two, it also has religious connotations because it, the same word is used when it talks about the high places that people sacrificed on. So it was a place, um, uh, it, it was a place that connotated some sort of uh, religion. On, on top or at the head of the heights, beside the way. Uh, okay, so it says, uh, by the way. So that would be kind of like the busy streets. The busy streets. Because if wisdom is going to get anybody's attention, it's got to be a populous area. It's got to be a place where a lot of people are or there's no sense in giving your speech. It would be pointless, right? Who would you be talking to? <laughs> and so streets are a place of commerce. And what is implied here in the first three verses it is that wherever wisdom is, whatever city this is, and we might assume that it's Jerusalem or wherever Solomon is reigning from, it's a place of commerce, it's a place of education, it's a place of, of business, it's a place of trading, it's a place of religion. So uh, it says, um, on top of the heights, beside the way, in other words, beside like a busy street, where the paths meet. So we're talking about a crossroads. We're talking about some sort of intersection. And all big cities had these meeting places, these big intersections, because what would happen is you would have traders from you know, Syria or traders from Egypt or traders from here or there, and they would be coming in from all different directions, but they would all converge at this crossroads at the meeting place, and that's where they kind of gave each other the news of where they were, where they've been, what's going on in the places where they're from. That's where people got the world news, the, 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 the local news. It's also where people did a lot of trading because you run into people from other countries, foreign countries, different places that you don't regularly go to. So you come into contact with merchandise that, you know, they didn't have Walmarts back then, right? They didn't have somebody that shipped from China to their local Walmart store. So you would have to meet these merchants at a crossroad in order to get those fine linens from Egypt or to get uh, another article or item that this country was best known for making. So it was a place of religion. It was a place of news. It was a place of business. It was a place of commerce. Um, and at the city gates, it says, beside the gates at the opening to the city. At the entrance of the door, she cries out. So when it talks about besides the gates, it's referring to the place where the leaders of the city would, would, would congregate. Because whenever you had an issue, whenever you had a problem, you could always be sure to find the leaders and the authorities at the city gates because that's where they rendered their judgments at. Even in the Torah, it talks about if, if somebody wants to be your slave for life, you take them to the doorpost and nail their ear to the doorpost. Because all legal transactions had to have witnesses. All legal transactions had to be done by the proper authorities of whatever city, town, village, or place that you were in. So that's where the judges and the rulers and the leaders would preside beside the city gates. So as wisdom is calling, she's calling to a plethora of different people from, from the lowest to the greatest. Because, you know, regular, regular people walk the streets. You know, just regular everyday Joes, the commoner, the common folk. You also have the merchants, which is a little step up, a little bit more prestigious, the businessmen, the merchants. And then finally, you have the rulers and the judges and the authorities. So wisdom is not placating to any particular people group. She's not <laughs> playing favorites. She's speaking to everyone because God's wisdom is for everyone. Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice on the top of the heights by the way where the paths meet. She takes her stand beside the gates at the opening of the city. All right. So basically from the privilege to the peasant, all backgrounds, all classes, all castes of people. All right. Let's start with uh, verse four. So here's wisdom. She's speaking, and wisdom basically has the, the entire chapter, the rest of the way. So wisdom says, to you, O men, I call, and my voice to the sons of men. 
So when it says to you, O men, that word men actually means mankind. It's actually the Hebrew word talking about the human race. So in in verse 3, we've already established that, you know, from the peasant to royalty, wisdom is, is, you know, addressing. But it's clarified even more that even sex isn't isn't, uh, an issue here. That it's for men and women alike. It's for all mankind. Uh, To you, O men, I call. And this word call is the exact same word that's used in verse 1. So wisdom is still roaring. To you, O men, I call. And my voice is to the sons of men. So the word call here is um, means to proclaim or to invite. You know, it it's kind of goes back to the old way of speaking, the old English way of speaking. Um, when I was little, it always confused me when I would see a sign on a business that says call again. So basically, that means we invite you back again, not necessarily telephone call or cell phone call, as I was thinking as a little kid. It says instead of come again, they would say call again. And whenever you had a suitor that was courting a young maiden, they would, it, it says that they would call, they would come, they would come a calling or they would come to call. So that's, yeah. So that's kind of what this is saying here. To you, O men, I call, or I'm giving this invitation, and my voice to the sons of men. Now, this word men here is different from the very first word men. The first word is uh, is mankind. And it says, my voice to the sons of men. It could basically say, my voice to the sons of Adam. It's still talking about the human race, still talking about mankind, but it's still even getting more specific because the sons of Adam, you know, that's the one who God uh, sent the Messiah to redeem is the sons of Adam. Not these, you know, not fallen angels, not demons, not any other intelligent entity or being, purely humans, sons of Adam. So we have very specifically who wisdom is wanting to address and talk to and call out to. All right, so, um, and and in this verse, you can kind of get the idea that it's, you know, calling out young and old from generation to generation because it's calling mankind or humankind or, you know, the whole world and then to the sons of men, which makes you think generation after generation, fathers and sons and and generations. All right, verse 5, O naive ones, discern prudence. So that word naive in uh, the King James, I think, is simple. It's probably translated simple. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and when you think of like, and that's another old English word. Now we say mentally handicapped. We don't use the word retarded. And uh, sometimes like the church I grew up in, we had what was called a special class. And the special class were for people who had special needs. They were for the mentally handicapped and the mentally disabled. And my cousin taught that class for years and years and years. And a lot of people, like from the old days or from the South, they would call them simple folk or simple people. So that's kind of what this is talking. Somebody who has a limited uh, mental capacity, a limited intellect. Oh, excuse me. I was told recently by a cousin, challenged. Challenged? Yeah, we I think I think a special people is nice, too, yes, because they are special because one I thing they are because I have one daughter that was labeled that. Well, you know, one thing I learned about special people growing up in a church that we dealt with special people. Sure, they had challenges, but we all have challenges. We could say we're all challenged in one way or another because we have different vices and, and different uh, um, phobias that we deal with. But they're special people because God. God allowed them to be that way for a, for a purpose. And I think one of those purposes is to be our teachers. Now, you know how blunt little kids could be and how simple little kids could be. And they have such pure hearts. And I remember this story a friend told me. She says she was teaching Sunday school class one time. And it was like, uh, I don't know, maybe six, seven, eight-year-olds, right? And among them was a man. 
but he had the mental capacity and intellect of an eight-year-old. And so uh, he was sitting there with the rest of the kids, and my friend asked one little boy to open up in a word of prayer. And so he says, Dear Lord, I want to thank you for this day and thank you for this Sunday school class. And I want to thank you for Billy for making him mentally handicapped because he could stay a kid forever. <laughs> I thought that was beautiful. I thought that was beautiful. Uh, you know, that is a good positive way to look at it. You know, because as an adult, sometimes I wish I could be a kid again. I didn't have to worry about paying bills. I didn't have to worry about, the only thing I had to worry about is which crayon I was going to use next. You know, you didn't have a lot of worries as a kid. Janice lived a normal life and she's not stupid. Right. Yeah, but just because she couldn't learn to read and write after at the high school, they labeled her. So I got her into Woodstock through the you know, residential living board. She's down there living on the campus. She's married. Yeah. She has no children, but she, it's her first husband to run over the front cabin. Now, a couple of years later, she married a good friend. She's well, I have a cousin who is special needs, and he was actually in the Special Olympics. And he has a greater mental capacity than most. He's actually married. I actually know quite a, some of the people that were in the Olympics for special needs. Uh huh. Stop. Yeah. She's one of the girls did really, does really well. Yeah. Well, so my, my cousin, uh, he's special needs, and he, um, I'd say he probably has the mental capacity of maybe a, a teenager. Uh, but he ended up getting married, and he married somebody else who was special needs. And they, they live a great independent life. Uh, so God has a lesson to teach us with people that are different whether they're handicapped, whether they're mentally challenged, what have you, there's a reason, huh? Yeah. There's an example right there. We could go on and on. Yeah, well, and, and one thing about Einstein, he, 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 he's the one who come up with the theory of relativity and is unlocking mysteries of the universe, but he couldn't tie his shoes. That's right. He couldn't do with so many things, but he was a genius. Yeah. And most people that have any kind of mental capacity, they're geniuses, and they don't learn the same way as everybody else. Yeah. They learn in a different way. Right. And he even had to paint his door red because he forgot which house he lived in. So he had to paint his door red to know where he – and, uh, you know, I think of other people. There's, there's, a, there's a man in our community, not the brightest uh, crayon in the box or the sharpest tool in the shed, but he is a musical savant. Yeah. You can give him any instrument and he'll play it. That's right. And that's amazing. So smart. They're very smart. Yeah. So it says – to you, O oh men, I call, and, my, and uh, my, my voice is to the sons of men. O oh, naive, so, uh, you know, the word simple, the, it also could be translated foolish. So foolish is another connotation, which means you just don't have common sense. I know people who have a lot of book learning, as they say. They may be doctors and have degrees, but they don't have any common sense. So the, and then there's people that are naive, that they're kind of gullible, but they believe anything that they tell you, you know, like, hey, you know, I'll sell you oceanfront property in Arizona, you know, or something like that. And they would believe it, you know. So this is to, to people who either are have a mental uh, disability or people that are just don't have any common sense. Uh, and I don't know, I think I would put a lot of teenagers in that category. There's a lot, I mean, I'm not saying that all teenagers are that way. There's some teenagers that have a great head on their shoulders, but the, but. You know, the word sophomore, what grade is that? Let's see. It's, uh, you have freshman, sophomore, so you have uh, – what would that be? What grade would that be? That would be 10th grade. Do you know what the word sophomore means? It means an educated fool. That's what the word sophomore means, and I think it's a perfect description because you may you, – you, know, you may be educated, but you don't have a lot of common sense. If you do have a lot of common sense at that age, you're very fortunate. My husband thought, they think they know it. <laughs> yeah. My husband thought that we would have Janice with us the rest of her life, but I, when mom, my other daughter, Lori, was down there at the travel agent, the two youngest girls, uh -huh. and I got her in down there myself. It was because I went to a meeting that Lori told me about that they were having, and where they wasn't going to take people from up this way, but that was when I got her in. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it, it, I, I, no matter what he told me, I wouldn't give up on anything. And it was good for her to learn to live away from, away from Yeah, me. for sure. And him, you know. Like. 
Well, I, I'll tell you the, the quickest education, you know, a lot of times as a teenager, you think that your parents are dumb. You think that they're stupid, that you think that they don't know anything, that they're behind the times, they're not with it, they're not cool. But yet, once I got married and started living out on my own, I quickly realized how smart my mom and dad really were. I got an education really quick. So the word, the word naive is, means simple or foolish or, you know, you could even say gullible. Uh, and, you know, like, like was pointed out, teenagers think that they know it all, you know. Uh, they have that point where they think that they know it all, but then they grow up and they realize they don't. Some of them don't stop thinking they know it all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, naive ones, discern prudence. So, the word discern means to observe, to pay attention to, to perceive. So, discern, there is a connotation of a decision making process. Or a recognition process. You know how some people are colorblind and they take that colorblind test. They can't tell red from green. You know, uh, sometimes red is green and green looks gray or whatever. So you have to be discerning to know the difference between red and green or green and gray. You have to discern. You have to observe. You have to perceive. You have to pay attention to. So another word for discern could be understanding. So it says, O naive ones, discern or know the difference or uh, pay attention to or understand prudence. So the word prudence uh, means, to, means to be discreet. It means to be subtle. It means to be crafty. It means to be cunning and wise. And those adjectives are usually taken or seen in a negative context. You know, when you say somebody is crafty or somebody is subtle or somebody is cunning, you think of somebody that's underhanded or deceitful. After all, the Bible says that the, that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, right? But there's good and bad to every... Dyslexia is an example. People can get right through and graduate from school, uh -huh. and they've had dyslexia, but they have hit it, and they've been able to handle it, but they didn't know they're not from their right. That's a... Had, yeah. They managed to graduate... And even go off to university and do it. But it was, it, I think that's what that means. Yeah, and that's a good example. And I can attest to that. I'm not dyslexic, but I have dyscalculia, which dyscalculia is the same as dyslexia, but with numbers. Numbers would always flip flop on me. So I was never good at math, and I'm still not good at math. But yet I understand uh, um, math concepts. I can understand math theory and string theory and all this fancy stuff dealing with math more than I could understand actually crunching numbers. So yeah, that's a, that's a good example. So uh, the word prudence, meaning discreet or subtle or crafty or cunning, even Yeshua was, was talking about in one of the, uh, uh, the uh, parables that he was speaking that, you know, we need to be as, as uh, uh, cunning, you know, to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. To be shrewd as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 10, 13, I think it is. Uh, so a lot of times we, we have a negative connotation of what subtlety is or craftiness is or cunning is or shrewdness is. Because it's often employed in a negative way to take advantage of somebody. But yet it doesn't always have to have a negative connotation. Uh, prudence actually it, it brings a better connotation to what... It means by being subtle or cunning or crafty because when you're prude, it, it, it brings the connotation that you're conservative, that you're sober, that you're vigilant, that you're alert, that you're on guard, that you're not going to be taken advantage of. And so I think that's what that means by prudence when we're talking about the other definitions like craftiness or cunning. So, oh, naive ones, discern or understand, pay attention to prudence or the subtleties or the subtle things because wisdom is not always straightforward wisdom does not enable you to be stupid wisdom is going to always challenge you wisdom is not going to is not just going to lay out the obvious in front of you and say here it is wisdom is going to make you work for it wisdom is going to make you dig for it that's what the proverbs are about the proverbs are poetic or witty sayings where the evident or where the meaning is not readily evident. You've got to read over the proverb two or three times to say, oh, that's what it's saying, or oh, that's what it means. And that's one of the best ways to learn is when you're thrown into something and have to figure it out. 
you know, they have all these fancy ways of learning languages, you know, Rosetta Stone and, you know, these apps where you could learn languages and stuff. But as painful as it is, immersion is the best way to learn a language when you just get thrown into thick of it. And way back in the day before, uh, before you know, it was considered child abuse, <laughs> they would throw kids off of, a, off of a boat to throw them right in the water so they would learn how to swim immediately. You either swim or you sink, you know? And that's, the, that's, that's what wisdom is trying to say here, is that, yeah, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to give you wisdom, but you're going to have to think about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you work your mind. You're going to have to earn this. Oh, naive ones discern prudence, and oh, fools discern wisdom. And that word wisdom um, is from the Hebrew word that means heart. Yeah, it says an understanding heart. An understanding heart. Yeah, I think that's a better translation, is an understanding heart. Because wisdom is, is chokhmah, and I think maybe possibly this word is lev or leb. I'm not sure. I'd have to, have to look it up. And ophuls discern wisdom or have an understanding heart. And I think that goes to say that, that wisdom is not a brain issue. Wisdom is not an intelligent issue. Wisdom is really a heart issue. Because you can know a lot of things in your head and not know it in your heart. Now, intellectually, you can understand and know, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, Yeshua uh, came and died on the cross to save us from our sins. You can intellectually understand that, but that doesn't mean that you're saved. Because there's 18 inches between your brain and your heart. And sometimes that knowledge in your head has to slowly leak and seep down and run down by gravity, by osmosis, into your heart before you truly get it. So somebody can understand the gospel message on an intellectual level, but then a light bulb goes off and they're like, oh! And then that's when they understand what salvation really is. And they say, yes, Lord, come into my heart and be my personal Lord and Savior. And then their heart is changed. Aaron DeMerchant, our good friend, is a perfect example of that. He was raised in a Christian home. He was raised. <coughs> you know, his father was a preacher. He was a preacher's kid. He knew the Bible backwards and forwards. He knew the gospel message backwards and forwards. But he didn't get it. And it wasn't until he went down a life of drugs and alcohol and abuse and sin that he kind of came to the end of himself. And then that's when the light bulb went off after going through the school of hard knocks. And he, he not only understood it in his head, he understood it in his heart. And the proof that he understood it in his heart is when he submitted to God, submitted to Jesus Christ, asked the Lord to come into his heart. He said, all that anger and bitterness and hate that I had in my heart was instantly gone. I can't explain it. I just loved everybody. He said, that's not normal. That's not me. I couldn't do that because I hated everybody. But once I got saved, the Lord took away that hate. That's when you know that it's, it, it went past the intellect and went into your heart. So that's what wisdom is getting to. It's like... I'm not trying to teach you. I'm not trying to educate you in, in, in intellectual things. I'm trying to, uh, to teach you and educate you on matters of the heart. Because that's where wisdom intonates from. That's where wisdom comes from. Okay, I think this is a good place to stop. So we'll pick it up in verse 6 next week. And uh, we'll go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Lord, we want to thank you for the, just the beauty of your word. I mean, how many of us knew that you could take Proverbs 8 and 9 and turn it into a three-act play? What a great, I mean, if we could actually get people to perform that, what a great visual that would be. And how the Proverbs would stick with us better if we, if we saw it in, in that way, in that light. And Lord, as we dig deeper into your word and just tear it apart and get down to the nuts and bolts of what each word means and how it applies to that sentence, Lord, help us to understand your word in such a way that we can uh, get a deeper appreciation, a deeper meaning uh, of it, and be able to understand it, not in our heads, that's a place to start, but understand it in our hearts so we can apply it to our lives, so we can start practicing and living out the principles that we're talking about and learning about. So that, Lord, when we go out in this wor world, we, can't, we not only have the ability to talk about the Proverbs, to teach the Proverbs, but we can live the Proverbs, which is more effectively. I, 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 I learn better by watching somebody do something than somebody telling me how to do it. And I learn better that way, and I think most of us do. So, Lord, help us to live out your word in front of others. 
Because they may hear how it's supposed to be done, and, and they may know the Bible and know the story, but when they see somebody live it, it takes on a totally more understandable, relatable meaning. And Father, we might be the only Bibles people ever read. We might be the only representation of Jesus Christ anybody ever sees. And we want to live up to that name, Christian. We want to live up to that name, being Christ-like, or being a little Christ, being a little Messiah. Because we want to walk in the footsteps of Yeshua, our Messiah, by walking and following in his word and in his commandments. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. The Plaster Rock United Baptist Church. Come join us every Sunday morning at 11 a.m.